Yeah. All right. Good evening, everyone. I'm Anita Slade, a library assistant here at River Falls Public Library. We are so excited to welcome writer, poet, and editor Sarah DeLuca. Her previous books include the memoir Dancing the Cow's Home, the family biography, The Crops Look Good, and a few books of poetry. Her work has also appeared in the Atlanta Review, Lullwater Review, North Coast Review, and elsewhere. Tonight, not only will Sarah share readings from her latest book, Heavy Marching, The Civil War Letters of Lute Mosley, 22nd Wisconsin, an intimate first-person account of his life as an infantry soldier. We also welcome Sarah's sister and pianist, Susan Hellerud, and tenor vocalist, Don Ofstedal, who will play and sing Civil War songs to add to Sarah's commentary. There will also be visual slides to enhance this program. If you're watching this live or even here, save your questions until the end um, or write them in the comments section at home, and we will try to get to some of them. Sarah will also be selling copies of some of her books, so please stick around. So without further ado, please welcome Sarah, Susan, and Don. First song we'll do is Deep River, which is an anonymous African-American spiritual. Like all spirituals, Deep River is a song of hope and longing, expressing a desire for peace and freedom, both in the present and in the afterlife. Through these melodies, slaves held on to the hope of survival and better times to come.
Good evening. Thank you so much for coming out to hear our program. And I'm privileged to share excerpts from this book, the wonderful letters written by Lucius Mosley, called himself Lute. He was a Wisconsin infantry soldier from Beloit. He was born exactly 100 years before I was, and the book came out exactly 100 years after his death. So there's a lot of serendipity here. Um, my granddaughter graduated recently with a history major from Beloit College, the very same college that Lute Mosley was in when he enlisted in the Civil War. Another strange thing that um, just came together beautifully was the fact that I was living in Atlanta, Georgia for 14 years. And during that time, I met Esther Mosley, who was the wife of Lute Mosley's grandfather. She was almost 90 when I met her. She was working on this letter collection that had never been published. She asked if I might help her with that. And she died a little bit after we got started. So it got put on hold for a long, long time. And I moved back to Wisconsin. And during COVID, I remembered, okay, I know what I can do with this time. And so for about two years, I worked with these letters, annotating, researching, um, getting them put into some kind of shape for publication. And the University of Wisconsin was very enthused about it. So I was extremely pleased that it was published by that fine press. I'm going to start by um, just reading a couple letters for you. Young Lute was only 19 when he enlisted. He had been a student at the Beloit Academy, which is kind of a college preparatory school that they had there. And he was going to start enrolling in the college when um, duty called. He was trained at camp at Utley in Racine. That was one of four training camps that Wisconsin had. And there we have Lute Mosley at 19 years old. Colonel William Utley was in charge of this training camp in Racine. He was a Wisconsin legislator and um, was appointed by the governor to lead Wisconsin's 22nd Regiment. Well, the first letter I have, there were about 125 in the book. I used most of them because all were interesting. From Covington, Kentucky, Camp Wright, Tuesday, October 14, 1862, Lute writes to his young brother, Eddie, who's only about 13 at the time, six years younger than Lute. Dear Brother Eddie, we are 40 miles from Cincinnati in Kentucky. The boys are all well. We have not lost a man yet from our regiment. We were three days on our way here. The first day we marched eight miles, the second day 15 miles, the third 17 miles, making it about 40 miles to the state line. Tomorrow we will march 16. Lots of boys give, give out on the way, but old loot is good for it. 17 miles not might seem like a long way to march, but with 40 pounds of cartridges in your and your knapsack on your back, your haversack filled with crackers, your canteen filled with warm water, and a heavy musket you are obliged to carry in position all the time and dust flying so thick you can't see. Well, it's a little different from taking your own natural gait. It is hard. I suppose you remember it was just two months ago that I enlisted. I cursed that day. If I was back in Beloit, 
I would remain there contented. I don't want you to think I have the blues. I haven't. I'm not sick of soldiering if they would only let us do it properly. We have to guard rebel property. Now we're camped on rebel ground. This man has two sons in the rebel army and we are not allowed to touch even a rail off his fence when we are nearly frozen to death. We can't touch an apple in the orchard along the road. We have to stand guard all night to keep others from touching such property. Good heavens, I ask, when will this rebellion be crushed out? I did not expect when I enlisted to fight against my own people. Well, when he talks about fighting against his own people, this is because he's in the border state of Kentucky, and Kentucky had not seceded from the Union. It always did remain in the Union, yet it was a slave state, and the citizens were very divided in their loyalties. So when Wisconsin soldiers came to Kentucky, and they were still in the Union, they expected to be treated as heroes and defenders, but often were treated as the enemy. The border states included um, Delaware, Missouri, Maryland, West Virginia, and Kentucky. And th those areas were very divided. Of course, there were great divisions all through the country, both in the Confederacy and in the Union. Not everyone was on the same side of these issues. And why would a young 19-year-old just eager to start his academic life decide to enlist in the Army? Many reasons, of course, but there was tremendous social pressure. Duty called. You wanted to serve your, your country, make your family, your region proud. And, of course, there was even some financial consideration here. $13 a month for an infantry soldier was the pay in the Union, even less in the Confederacy. And that was a big help. Um, he could send $10 of that home to his father and mother who were struggling on a small farm, and he kept $3 for himself. Sometimes he had to ask for a dollar or two back. But it was a consideration. And, of course, the other thing was they thought this war would surely end in a few months, maybe a year at most. Who knew it would go on with such death and destruction? So there's a picture of the 22nd Wisconsin crossing a pontoon bridge at Cincinnati. Camp Baird, Danville, Kentucky, December 28, 1862. There have been 30 out of the regiment that have already died. Five died in one night. They say that Calvin Bullock is dead and his brother Bert is very sick. They were left at Nicholasville. There are a great many sick. When we left Racine, we had 96 men and now there are not over 50 fit for duty. My health is still pretty good. We have to remember that in, all through the Civil War, the death from disease was tremendous um, for everyone who died of a battlefield wound. There were at least two dying from disease. Thursday, we had just finished burying our dead boys whom we had orders to march to, to Mumfordsville, 55 miles from here. So in the morning, we pulled up and started. We marched 15 miles, and it rained as hard as it could. The mud was ankle deep, and the clay stuck so fast to our feet, making it anything but easy marching. Well, germ theory wasn't yet understood, of course, and uh, there was poor sanitation, not enough time in some of these quickly constructed camps to... Um, build any good latrines or find a good uh, way to have clean drinking water. 
there was inadequate diet, exposure to the elements, all of this contributed to high rates of illness and death. The major fatal illnesses included dysentery, pneumonia, malaria, typhoid, and cholera. On January 15, 1863, he wrote, this country through the part, this part of the States is to a Northern boy at least anything but inviting, nothing but hills and rocks. Until he thinks it is not the country, but the union we are fighting for, he feels like complaining and wonders why so much blood is shed over so poor a country. And the people are different from our Northern ones. He goes on to complain about um, the lack of education, the fact that nobody seems to know how to make change for a dollar even, and uh, there are so few schoolhouses. He's used to Wisconsin with all our wonderful rural schoolhouses five or six miles apart. Of course, that was part of our dairy farming culture. You had to get the milk to market. There were little settlements very close and schoolhouses. There was even a law that uh, no child should have to walk more than three miles to school. So that would make five or six miles, we'd have a schoolhouse. So Lute is not real impressed with what he's seeing of the South so far. <laughs> and he says um, in a letter, it's, it is the union we are fighting for. He doesn't mention President Lincoln's Emancipation Proclama Proclamation. That was announced on January 1, 1863, and it marked a turning point in the war, refocusing the objective on abolishing slavery as well as preserving the Union. Of course, it's hard to separate those issues. They're very intertwined. It seems, according to the correspondence of Lut Mosley and many other Civil War letters that I have read, many collections now and studied um, in the archives in the university and at the uh, Wisconsin Historical Society, and very few of them really are talking about abolishing slavery. But this comes up later on as they see what's really going on in the South and gain compassion. And Lute's letters reflect that as, as he uh, gains more experience and sees more as he goes further South. February 9, 1863, he's camped near Nashville. Just two weeks ago this morning, we left Danville, Kentucky. We didn't know which we were going, which way we were going. We marched 14 miles on the pike toward Louisville. It rained constantly. I rode in a government mule team most of the way. I had diarrhea pretty hard. The boys found some straw to make a bed of about a mile from camp. The next morning, we started pretty early and marched 17 more miles. The rain turned to snow. He continues to describe some terrible conditions. We were camped in an awfully muddy place. And I was near, we were not near a city, but I still couldn't find any straw. So I stole an armful of hay from the mules. And I have to tell you, I never felt so mean and sick as I did then. It struck me as rather strange that he could feel so bad about stealing hay from a mule. And yet um, he writes of some pretty horrific battles and terrible death and destruction and wounding of soldiers and writes it almost dispassionately. So it's, it's um, maybe human nature that it's the small things that sometimes bring us down and we have to stay strong in the in the really big battles the real test 
sometimes it's just the small things that kind of get to you. Well, that was the last letter that Lute wrote for a while because he was um, captured in the Battle of Thompson Station along with many of his fellow soldiers and sent to Libby Prison. But before we, we talk about that, I think we'll have another song. Wait for the wagon. Oh, did I skip something? Sorry. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, battle cry of freedom. Yep. Thank you. So, yes, battle cry of freedom, also known as rally round the flag. This song was written by George Root in 1862. Advocate. There we have a picture of Libby Prison. It's in Richmond, Virginia. It was one of about 150 prison camps. Um, both the Confederacy and the Union had many prison camps. This one was not a pleasant place to be. Most of them were not. Although, in general, the Confederate prisons were harsher places than the Union prisons mostly due to a lack of resources um, and staffing. Libby Prison was an old brick warehouse on Tobacco Row near the James River. The enlistment men were housed in a room with barred windows, many of which were broken, so it was drafty and cold. 
It was densely crowded, teeming with vermin. The men slept on filthy bare floors jammed together so tightly that there was just enough space to lie down. Each prisoner ferociously guarded his territory. Sick Bay had no doctor, only a former undertaker who tried to comfort the ill as best he could. The Confederate Army had taken all available doctors for their own wounded. There were a few supplies such as medicines, clean bedding, and bandages. The sick soldiers were on their own. Many men sickened or suffered mental derangement under the strain of prison life. Loot was determined to survive and some, somehow, someday, leave the nightmare. Fortunately, he was confined there only 29 days, um, after which time he was exchanged for a Confederate prisoner. Both sides agreed under a cartel of prison exchange in July of 1862 to trade and parole all prisoners within 10 days of capture. Of course, that rarely happened, but um, at least in this case, they did have an exchange, and, and the exchanges were stopped shortly after that because um, General Grant and Lincoln agreed with him that the uh, Confederacy was gaining more from these exchanges than the Union, so they were stopped altogether. Anyway, he did, he did uh, get released along with many of his fellow soldiers, and they were sent to Annapolis to uh, recover for a while. And he wrote from Annapolis on April 2nd, 1863. We came here on the flag of truce boat, Metamora, this morning. Of course, you've heard about our fight, our capture. We've been 29 days in Dixie and seen some rough times. I was in the foremost of the fight. In fact, I fired the first shot from our regiment and was there until it was over, and I did not receive a scratch. He was uh, promoted to corporal um, during that, uh, right after that battle during, uh, because of his bravery. We expect to leave here tomorrow or the next day for some Western camp. We're drawing a new suit of clothes. I think there are over a thousand body lice on me, and I am no worse than the rest. We have been nearly starved to death, getting about a half a loaf of bread and some stinking meat each day. But I thank God I'm back in our lines well and sound, and I will spend my life, if need be, to kill the miserable, unprincipled wretches. Of course, as in any war, they demonize the enemy. Otherwise, how could you do this terrible work? After leaving Annapolis, then Lute and his comrades were sent uh, to a parole camp. There was, under this um, exchange agreement, these parole troops could not engage in any kind of battle or anything related to battle. So they had really nothing to do for quite a long time. And during this long parole period, it was several months, um, some of them just wandered home and were able to visit their families because they really didn't have any assignment of importance. And they called that French leave, which the French um, had a term for leaving a party without saying goodbye to the host. So <laughs> without saying goodbye to the host, Lute and some of his fellow soldiers went home for a little while. Well, finally, he was back, um, back in duty and happy to be back on the march. Let's have... Um, the next song. <laughs> oh, it was uh, Wait for the Wagon. I meant to say something about that. They had in the camps what they called sutlers. They're kind of like traveling salesmen to the troops, and they would come around with their wagons um, 
full of all kinds of um, little necessities like combs and handkerchiefs and maybe some food treats that weren't normally supplied, all kinds of oh, stationary um, envelopes and paper to write on, that sort of thing. And the arrival of this settler in the camp with his wagon was a great celebration. So we can have Perfect. something about that. Sure. It's an American folk song, Wait for the Wagon, was first popularized in the early 1850s. It was written by a man named R.F. Buckley, who led a minstrel troupe called Buckley's Serenaders. The catchy tune was picked up by Civil War soldiers who relied on horse-drawn wagons for essential supplies. Both Union and Confederate armies adapted the original lyrics and employed Buckley's song as a lively marching tune. <laughs> Sunday, April 19, 1863, Benton Barracks, St. Louis. All of us are worn out. Some have scurvy. There are but 18 of our company here. I am poor as a snake, but I have gained since I got back to America. I feel like fighting them as long as I live. We all got as lousy as we could be, and our hips are worn out from lying and sitting on the floor so much. He says, um, back to America, which he's in St. Louis, Missouri. It it made me think, okay, this these are two separate governments, two separate countries. And we always used to use that term, war between the states. And I used it in some of my commentary and footnotes, but the historians at the uh, university press said, no, um, we aren't using that term. It's um, not war between the states. Now, in the South, they like to call it the war of northern aggression. And, of course, in the North, it was um, the war of southern rebellion. Today, we're saying the Civil War. Dear ones at home, this is... June 11, 1863. It's a lovely morning and everything looks pleasant and cheerful. Our regiment was all paid off yesterday, $78 for six months. Paid to us here. And last night, I assure you, a great many boys were full as drunk as ever we were at home. They were noisy and boisterous. Today, the camp is full of peddlers of every description. I think over a hundred watches have been sold. We brought, we bought a new set of instruments. I gave a dollar toward them. Um, he talks very often about these bands that they have in the regiment, and that was music was so important in the camps to keep up the morale and boost the 
patriotic fervor, of course, too. The pay was supposed to be delivered every two months, but it was often delayed for various reasons. Logistics were a problem. Battles, sudden troop movements. Sometimes they were in areas that were just about impossible to reach. And, of course, that, in, that affected the families at home, too, because a lot of these allotments, in Lute's case, $10, was sent directly to the family at pay time. And they were counting in that money, so sometimes it was long delayed. Well, the official, uh, the official prisoner exchange finally came on June 9, 1863. So um, the 22nd Wisconsin was back into real service. And they reported for duty to General William Rosencrantz, commanding the Army of the Cumberland. July 2, 1863, he's camped at Franklin, Tennessee. Dear ones at home, I have a little news to tell you, and I wish I didn't have to do it, because it's an awful disgrace on both our regiment and our state. Ever since our fight, there has been hard feelings between our officers, Colonel Utley and Lieutenant Colonel Bloodgood. They've been at sword points and each watching for an opportunity to prefer charges against the other. Some of the commissioned officers were on one side, some on the other. Everyone has an opinion. I am a blood good man. These increasingly bitter conflicts between the officers continued for many months and affected the morale and I expect the performance of the regiment. Murfreesboro, Tennessee, September 5, 1863. He says, how thankful I am to have my pen to communicate with you and my absent and far off friends. I often think of those poor Negroes leaving their families to go and help in this great struggle. For few can read or write. There was the other day over a, hundred, uh, over a thousand of these poor human beings here they were captured from the Rebs who were running them down south. Mostly men, but some women and children. I don't know what they will do with the women and children. The men they have put into a regiment and taken the rest to Nashville. I pity them, so downhearted and discouraged. Most every day the cars are loaded with Reb prisoners being sent north. I like to see them going, but there are also a great many of our poor boys with wounds to show for the price of these rebel prisoners. A person can get some idea of war, even if he goes no further south than here. It's a great wonder to me that those prisoners coming through here see us well clothed and hollering and running and feeling well, and see our large warehouses filled with plenty of hardtack and sow belly. How can they want to go back and support a government that allows its soldiers to go about half clad and half fed as they are? I am thankful I was brought up in the north. A great many are going north each day. There are wagons drawn by old mules and a broken down horse or some old cavalry horses. They say they want to go where they won't have to pay $12 per pound for salt. The inflation was really out of control in the Confederacy. Um, it was inflation in the North as well, but in the Confederate States, the money was almost worthless at this point. And Lute's letters are, are starting to reflect his increasing empathy and understanding of the plight of the Negroes and all who were suffering the terrible, devastating effects of war. Well, Another song? It's composed in 1863 by George Root. This, uh, this piece, subtitled The Prisoner's Hope, struck a chord in the heart of every prisoner of war. In Andersonville, the most notorious of the southern prisons, rumors that Union troops were on their way to liberate the men were constantly circulating. Hope of liberation, of escape, 
release or prisoner exchange was often the only thing that stood between prisoners and total despair. The title um, of the book became Heavy Marching because there's so much tramp, 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 and heavy marching that Lute writes about all through his three years of service. I had wanted to call it Ever Dear Home because he starts many letters with that very tender salutation, and I thought it was lovely, but... Um, I was advised that that's a little too sentimental for a book that is as fierce and, um, you know, it, it's not really a sentimental story. It's it's really full of sacrifice and tragedy and the difficulty of war. So um, we did change it. Lots of marching in this in this book. We have some typical scenes um, of camp life coming up here. A lot of time spent in camps. It was kind of a hurry up and wait. You always hear that about, about war. Um, some, a lot of waiting punctuated by absolute terror, of course, during these battles. Well, Lute writes November... 29, 1863, from Mur Murfreesboro, Tennessee. I was on guard down at the depot a few nights ago, and a train came in from the front, loaded with Negro women and children. I never knew what want was. If they weren't a pitiful lot of humans, I never want to see any that are. I had a loaf of bread and some coffee, and I gave it to them. They all got some rations in the morning. They came from Alabama. They say there isn't a fourth enough to eat there. In his letter of April 29, 1864, he describes a difficult march through mountainous terrain. Soldiers carried only the most basic supplies, a shelter tent, rubber blanket, canteen, small tin coffee pot, daily rations. As was often the case, Lute and his infantry comrades had little knowledge of the destination or the strategies. But General Sherman was at the helm of forces totaling an estimated 110,000 men closing in on the key city of Atlanta. In his letter dated May 21, 1864, Lute describes the Battle of Resaca, which took place the previous week. And although the battle was not decisive, the boys of the 22nd saw it as a glorious victory. He said, the dead and dying rebs covered the grounds. I went down in one's pocket and got some pins and needles, some Confederate script, a knife, some plug tobacco, which I gave to the boys, who were awfully glad, for they hadn't had any for a long time. 
The ribs are all gone now, leaving their dead and wounded on the field. The estimated casualties, uh, casualties from that battle um, was approximately 5,500 men, about evenly divided between Union and Confederate soldiers. It is amazing to read his really dispassionate accounts of this type of tragedy. And then, as I mentioned before, feeling so bad about stealing hay from a horse. Once in a while, there's a little humor here, too. He says, um, in July 7, 1864, Charlie says, Lute, come and have some coffee. He's a good boy, I tell you. Well, I'm going to drink my coffee, and then I'll seal this up and send it. But I want to tell you how Charlie had a letter directed to him. Over the hills, with love and joy, this letter goes to a soldier boy. Overcome every obstacle. Go in a hurry until you reach Charles P. Murray, 22nd Wisconsin, Company B, in the city of Nashville, Tennessee. And that was how the letter was addressed. And of course, it got there. Amazing how letters did reach them as much as they did. I'm sure some were lost, but they did receive most of their mail, I think. They numbered it often, the, the families writing as well as the soldiers would number their letters so they would be able to tell if there were any that were missing and put them in some kind of sequence because sometimes they would arrive in bunches and then there'd be long periods where they weren't arriving at all. Railroads were torn up, of course, and it it was like, like the pay just didn't always arrive when you wanted it to. Oh, I think we need one more song and then we're gonna have the Battle of Georgia after that. Um, Tenting on the Old Campground was written in 1863 by a young New Hampshire musician named Walter Kitteridge. A professional singer, Kitteridge performed his song in Union Army camps where it became very popular. The song gave voice to the universal weariness of soldiers and civilians longing for an end to the war.
Loot rates. I, I've been trying to figure out where we are, and as near as I can come at it, we are about 15 miles off the Chattahoochee River, about 10 miles from there to Atlanta. I'm not sure how long it will be before we'll get there, but this much I can tell you, I will be glad when the day comes for I think this campaign will end and we can have a rest and a chance to wash and put on clean clothes. This has been a long, hard campaign. General Sherman is acting very wisely, I think, for he flanks them out and lets them do the charging instead of fighting them as we did at Stones River and Missionary Ridge. Right on the ground where I'm sitting, day before yesterday was held by Rebs. Here they charged on our lines. I would give $50 if you could have gone over this place when we advanced yesterday and seen the dead Rebs, lots of them. How do you suppose, how far do you suppose a shell shot from a 12 pounder will go into a green oak tree? Guess before I tell you. I have seen trees that I think are more than two feet through with a five inch hole clear through them. How much farther it went, I don't know. Now, how far would that big Lincoln gun throw a ball into wood? Some ribs have had their heads taken slick off. The woods are all cut up with cannon shot and musketry. I guess that tonight the Rebs will get out of this if they can. I don't know and I don't care. For the longer they stay here, the worse it will be for them to stop again. About the presidential election, I think old Abe will be elected, and I certainly hope he will. He will have my vote. The only hope the rebels have is that we will elect some other man in his place. I think they will give in if we can put Lincoln in again. I surely hope that you at home will do your utmost for his support. You will, won't you, Father? Well, of course, Lute is addressing his father here. Um, women are not voting, and they will not be voting for another 56 years. The weapons of the day were crude by today's standards, but they did have repeating rifles now, and they were able to deliver several shots without a need to reload, which was a major advancement, and it was outstripping the military tactics of the day, so the result was human toll of injury and death. So Sherman was a brilliant strategist, and he was learning how to um, flank and not march his soldiers straight into that kind of fire. July 12, 1864, near Marietta, Georgia, he says, we are now on picket within two rods of the river, and the ribs are as near on the other side. The river is only 15 rods across. Night before last was the first time we were down so near. We went right out, and in the morning, the Johnnies found the Yanks under their noses. They yelled out to our boys, Oh, Yanks, if you won't fire, we won't. Well, Johnny agreed. So there the two enemies were, right out in plain sight. And we built fires. Our boys went to cooking coffee, and theirs made Johnny cake. And it was not long before there were some of them on our side of the river drinking coffee with our boys. And our boys went over to them and they gave us tobacco. Every time they crossed, they had to swim. Last night, some came over and joined the Union. Johnny Reb and Billy Yank, as they called each other, were frequently in close contact. And a lot of Civil War narratives have examples of this kind of fraternization across picket lines where they would exchange food and tobacco and jokes even. Um, I think they, in those kinds of circumstances, they, they must have understood these are boys like us, very much like us, and yet they had to maim and kill each other and somehow would celebrate those victories. Similar thing that 
a couple of days later, he said, we're in the same place as when I wrote you last. We have great times talking with the Johnnies. Our skirmish line is right on the edge of the river and theirs is close on the other side. We go in swimming on our side and they on theirs at the same time. The day I was down there, there were a hundred of each on the banks talking and trading. We would swim to them and trade anything we had for tobacco. One of them gave me a piece. They are very generous and talkative. Not a shot is fired on either side. Up in the 17th Corps, they pop away all the time. Our line is right under their forts, but they sit and run around all over, and each is true to his word, as maintains the silence. There are orders now on both sides. We mustn't talk, but we still go in swimming. We don't speak. Camp in the field, July 21, 1864. I tell you what, it is a big victory for us. We have never had such a good chance to show what we are. And remember, there were four lines of Rebs and only two of us, but it was an open field and a fair fight, and we whipped them two to one. He's talking about the Battle of Peachtree Creek, which was a victory that boosted the morale of the regiment. They felt um, redeemed, and Coburn's brigade, of which Lutz Regiment was a part, felt like their fighting qualifications would never again be questioned. Um, we have a song about Georgia, don't we? Marching into Georgia. This marching song was written by Henry Clay Work near the end of the American Civil War. The title and lyrics of the song refer to U.S. Army Major General William T. Sherman's march to the sea to capture the Confederate city of Savannah, Georgia in late 1864. The march took 32 days and left a swath of destruction across the state, 88 miles wide and 300 miles long. Lute writes, on um, August 24, 1864, infantry near Atlanta, he says, two years ago, today was the last before I started off to try the fortunes of war. In these two short years, I have experienced more hardship than ever before in my previous life and more than I ever expect my future life will hold in store for me. I have one long year yet untried. 
Sometimes the future looks dark, but I still hope to see the end. At all events, I'm very glad that neither you nor our dear father, he's writing to his young brother, will likely be called upon to try your fate in the army. I never could bear the thought of either of you having to go through what I have. I would much rather go myself for another three years. The military draft <clears throat> was in effect now in both North and South. The third federal conscri conscription act extended to all able-bodied men ages 17 to 50 with no occupational exemptions. Drafted men could still provide a substitute by paying $300 as a commutation fee. That would be like 7,500 in today's money. And a lot of people didn't have that kind of money. So it outraged a lot of people who felt it was a poor man's war, a poor man's fight in a rich man's war. Lute's father was 53 at the time, and Eddie was 16, so they both were outside of those limits. He goes on to um, write about spending time in skirmish pits, and they would dig holes in the ground and um, spend their time in a very uncomfortable situation. And a lot of the people in Atlanta were doing the same for protection. September 11, 1864, I suppose you expect an interesting letter now that we are in the key city so long fought for and so coveted by the Yankees. You certainly don't know how much you have to be thankful for that our lot was cast in the north instead of this part of the world. Most of the citizens have gone south with the army and what are left are said to be bad characters mostly. General Sherman says that everyone not in the government employ should leave the city. There are lots of women here who have had their husbands killed in the rebel army and I suppose they've actually been obliged to disgrace themselves to obtain a living. Yesterday, I went down through the city. It's been a pretty place, but there's not a nice dwelling house left here. The destruction of property has been large. In the north half of the city, every house is torn by Yankee shells. Everyone in the city ha is <clears throat> has what we call bummer's holes, which consist of a hole dug deep in the ground and covered with dirt from three to nine feet deep where they live. How would you like such a dwelling place? He writes about the um, foraging, how they go out and really strip the country of not just food, but sheets off the beds, kettles out of the kitchen, things that they don't need but they're going to crush the spirit of the South and try to end the war quicker that way. October 20, 1864, he says, on the 15th, our brigade with two others from the 1st and 2nd Divisions and 750 wagons went off foraging. We filled our wagons with corn, and the boys put a great many dead hogs, sheep, chickens, geese, ducks, and sacks of sweet potatoes, jugs of sorghum, cans of lard, etc., on top of the wagons. Charles Murray and I brought in one canteen of sorghum, eight pounds of dried apples, two chickens, one mutton, a little port, pork steak, and four good messes of sweet potatoes. We were gone four days. 400 wagons went before and came back all loaded. Tomorrow there's another train going. We drove 60 head of cattle and some sheep and horses and mules. In fact, we are stripping the country of everything. 
Besides, we captured two or three Johnnies. There are some few ribs here, but they fall back as fast as we come up. We will not starve. We have rations to last us a good long while. You have Battle Hymn of the Republic now, okay? In 1861 visit to Washington, D.C., American poet and staunch abolitionist Julia Ward Howe heard Union troops belting out a well-known marching song called John Brown's Body. She felt compelled to create new lyrics, employing biblical imagery to predict the evil, the end of evil, and the coming of justice. In February 1862, she sold her poem to the Atlantic Monthly Magazine for $5. Throughout the Civil War, Battle Hymn of the Republic became a rallying cry of the Northern cause, reprinted a million times and sung on a thousand marches. It would endure as America's wartime anthem long after the guns fell silent in 1865. <laughs> Thurman is supposed to have told the mayor of Atlanta, war is cruelty and you cannot refine it. I think that true statement is holding, holding true now. And I don't know what we've learned from all of this. I'm gonna skip forward a little bit um, here. He does write, about marching through the Carolinas. The Carolina campaign was also really brutal and uh, they stripped that country pretty well too as they went through. Yes. April 16, 1865, um, he, he writes from uh, somewhere in North Carolina, doesn't really say where. Um, the future looks brighter and surely I have strong hopes of being allowed the great enjoyment of once more returning to your kind and loved society. I love the way they, they wrote. I, I'd like a letter like that from my son. 
<laughs> um, anyway, ending up in Washington, D.C. and the Grand Review, that was quite a display, hundreds of thousands of soldiers. Oh, I do want to mention um, his April 16, 1865 letter. It was officially announced to us this morning that President Abraham Lincoln was assassinated at a theater in Washington. I don't believe it yet. There's a report this afternoon that it is not so. I hope it will prove untrue, <clears throat> surely. But of course, it was true. Abraham Lincoln was shot by the actor John Wilkes Booth at Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C. on the evening of April 14, 1865, and he died the following morning. So the soldiers were really uh, very upset about that, and uh, he writes some about it. He writes about the Grand Review, the march through Washington, and none of them are too happy about all this um, display marching after having marched thousands and thousands of miles, and now just for display, but it was a grand celebration and they were just eager to be home. Captain Bradley of the, 22nd Regiment summarized the distances marched and transported by the 22nd Wisconsin. 2,700 miles by railroad, 2,400 miles by steamboat, and on foot, 2,400 miles, totaling 6,500 miles. His last letter home, or at least the last one that was, was saved, was... Um, this May 25, 1865 letter. And Lute did return home. He became a farmer with his father and uh, also did carpentry, married, raised a family of five children and was very active in the Grand Army of the Republic throughout his life. And he, he hosted reunions on his farm giving the soldiers a chance to get together, share their memories and feelings about the war, which certainly was difficult to share with people who hadn't experienced it. He died shortly before his 80th birthday. He's buried in Beloit's Oakwood Cemetery. I think we should have Johnny Comes Marching Home as a little celebration that he did survive the war and live a Johnny Comes Marching Home. This well-known Irish tune was given new words by a well-known band leader named Patrick Gilmore. Published in 1863, the song expressed longing for the return of loved ones who were fighting in the war of the rebellion or the war of aggression as it was called in the confederacy it became immensely popular and was sung by soldiers and civilians on both sides of the war
Thank you, Don and Susan. Thank you very much. And thank you all for coming. Um, I know we're running a little late. I do have some books over there if anyone interested. And do we have time for a few questions or comments? Yes. Oh, well, they did. Um, you mean as far as battles and that sort of thing? Or, or, Oh, right. Yeah. Right. Well, um, I do have in the uh, appendix of the book the list of his company, not the entire regiment, which would be about a thousand people, but in the company about a hundred people. And what was, uh, you know, who was mustered out, who was wounded, who died, and so on. But in general, um, in the Wisconsin service in the Civil War, about one of eight did not survive. That doesn't count to the uh, injuries, however, um, but about one of eight was killed in the war or died of, of disease. Uh -huh. And I think that's fairly typical in general. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? I just wanted to thank you all for coming out tonight and those who are watching online. There are a few online. Um, continued best wishes. Thanks. on your next endeavor. I'm not sure what it is yet, but um, for more, do you have a website or follow you on Facebook? No, I or? don't, but the um, University of Wisconsin Press has um, quite a bit about the book and there are, I have written some blogs that can be accessed through the was, uh, okay. University. So go to uwpress.com. Um, I can't remember, but anyway, I, U University of Madison. <laughs> Right. Wisconsin and Madison. I have some papers over there with a reading guide and also a blog that I've written, and it has the website on that. Okay, perfect. All right. For more details on future events, go to riverfallspubliclibrary.org um, and click on library events. Your support means a lot, and have a great rest of your evening. Thank you. Welcome.